Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Vintage Books Live. Tonight, we're really excited to have Rebecca Heisman, whose new book, uh, Flight Paths, just released a week ago. Yay. Um, and it's a nonfiction book about how scientists work to solve the mysteries of bird migration. So I'm just going to jump right in. I normally ask about the story of how the book came to be, and I'm going to save that one for a little later because... What I'd really like to know is what got you interested in birds to begin with? Um, because it's not just this book. You've actually been writing about birds for quite a while. So can you talk about like just early experiences with birds and what got you excited and interested about them? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's one I haven't been asked a whole lot. Um, and it's true, this is, this is the only book that I've written, but I basically write about ornithology. That's pretty much what I do. I'm a freelance bird writer. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a really good answer for what first got me interested in birds. My parents were not bird watchers, but like a lot of people, they in winter, they would put up a bird feeder in the backyard just for fun to see what came in. And so I always liked looking at that. And then a lot of birders have what they refer to as a spark bird, like one bird that they saw that really like captured their interest and kind of sucked them in. And so when I was a kid, I remember one winter, a different, like, you know, we always have cardinals and blue jays and chickadees and nut hatches and sparrows, but like a different bird that I've never seen before showed up at the theater. And my parents had like a little kind of crappy birds of Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Ohio field guide that they never used. And so I flipped through it and figured out that it was what the book said was a rufous sided towhee, which now has been split and it's called the Eastern towhee. And it was, it was a bird that I'd never seen before that was in this book that was on the ground under the theater in our backyard. And I thought that was really cool. And so I guess that's kind of what got it started. I didn't really know any other bird watchers or people who were interested in birds until I started college. So, so that's when I was able to like meet other people who were interested in this and that's and, like go birding for real with other birds. Oh, so, neat. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. I, I was trying to think, you know, I grew up with a mom and dad who were very into science and mm -hmm. nature and we were out tromping around in the woods a lot but I think the one that got me started was um we put up humming our feeders in the backyard one winter after we moved into this house and the hummingbirds showed up yeah it was like it's winter <laughs> what the heck are you doing here <laughs> and that kind of kind of got me interested because I had no idea here on the west side we actually have wintering hummingbirds but I had grown yeah. up on the east side and had no idea they hung around so it's interesting how like one bird will kind of get you interested in and spark questions and then well, and then you got to go from there those wintering and as hummingbirds have expanded I live in Walla Walla so east, yeah, east yeah. And Washington, well you're in Washington you're in Vancouver we have Anna's hummingbirds here in the winter oh now. wow okay so yeah since then they've shifted they've expanded their yeah. region yeah well I remember going and looking for them in, a, in an older bird book and you know it said they weren't here because yeah. at the <laughs> time that book was written they yeah. weren't <laughs> yeah so, yeah so what was the story of the book how did you what sparked you to go from you know articles and mm -hmm. reports and all kinds of stuff that you've been actually doing for quite a while to a book link project yeah I actually, I do talk in the introduction of the book about like how the book came to be, but basically before COVID, I was working full-time for the American Ornithological Society, which is the big professional organization for scientists who study birds. They do, you know, grants and conferences and stuff. Yeah. And I was their one-person communications department. And so a lot of what I did was writing press releases and blog posts to promote the research that they were publishing in their scientific journals. So I was reading a lot of formal scientific papers about new bird research and trying to write something interesting about them. And I kept getting really fascinated by the methods section of the papers, which is where they talk about how they did the research. Because I was reading all these papers where they studied bird migration using weather radar, where they studied it by recording the flight calls of, of migrating birds passing overhead, or they studied bird migration by analyzing hydrogen isotopes in bird feathers. And I just started, I, I think I had always sort of thought it would be fun to write a book eventually and that it would make sense to write a book about birds since that's what I knew a lot about but there's you know there's been a lot of really good popular science books written about birds and at some point while I was yeah. wondering about all these cool methods and how they work and who figured this out it occurred to me that that might be a bird book that no one had written yet it was like the, the, the backstory of study bird migration that's awesome 
Yeah, because it is. It's it's you know you you. I was sitting here writing, you know, right, figuring out what questions I wanted to ask and just kind of flipping through all the different chapters. And there's just so many fascinating um, different ways that, and, and, and honestly, it was what was amusing. One of the thing that was really amusing to me was a lot of it started seems to have started in the 70s not all of it obviously a lot of it's a lot older than that but you yeah. know these scrappy scientists in the 70s with their you know whatever equipment they can cobble together you know running around in their pickup truck and chasing yeah. after <laughs> birds which i thought was just <laughs> lovely exactly exactly so tell me about um because I, I, I remember following your Instagram page when you were working on this book and like yeah. seeing all the cool things that you were getting to, you know, learn about and participate in. And so if you could just share like some of this sort of standout field experiences that you got to do while you were researching for the book. Yeah. So a lot of the research was reading a lot of papers and doing a lot of Zoom interviews. But I did on several occasions actually travel to go out into a field with a scientist um, I did several really fun things. I went to Illinois to join a, a friend of mine, who's an ornithologist in Illinois named Ariel Fernier, who was catching rails, which are these really secretive, weird little birds that live in wetlands to put radio transmitter tags on them. And so I got out to go with her into a wetland at night to catch rails. And it was this bizarre experience because this method that she developed when she was a PhD student for catching rails, it's very effective. But what she does is she slowly drives an ATV into a wetland with a row of people spread out on either side of her, kind of forming a line of walkers going in on either side. And the people have headlamps, spot lamps, and hand nets. And the rails will flush in front of the ATV and the walkers and like fly a short distance and then land and then they stay put. So every time someone flies up, all the people on foot like like get their foot, their headlamps on this thing and just run after it with headlamp with their, with their hand nets and just go <laughs> and, and it was the straight it was the most outlandish way of catching a bird that, I, I, that is but I mean that is amazing and funny but also just you know a reminder I guess that sometimes the uh, old-fashioned ways work why are we were so many mosquitoes we were getting eaten alive by mosquitoes in this wetland in the middle of Illinois just like running through the marsh with our after birds with our headlamps and our nets it was it was you have to be there to believe it. It was bizarre. Now I'm like, you need to have like a video, like little videos, yeah. <laughs> all these crazy adventures. Yeah. So did I can't remember because I remember that there were some things that you went and did that were, you know, like maybe things didn't work out quite the way. And that's kind of how science works sometimes. Did you catch anything that night? I can't remember. Yeah, well, it was funny because plan A was she had traps out for the rails, like like cages with recordings of rail sounds playing that were supposed to lure them in. And I was going to be there for two days. And so we spent both days going around during the day checking all of her traps and they were empty. And so the evening of the last night that I was going to be there, she was like, we're not going to let you go home without seeing me put a radio transmitter <laughs> on one of these rails. I need to catch a rail. So we're going to do it the way I did it when I was a grad student. I'm going to go to Walmart and get some headlamps and some nets and we're going to do this. So that was sort of our last ditch attempt to That's catch a rail. Awesome. <laughs> and I think you, did you catch a Sora rail? Was that yeah. the one you caught? They're yeah. so pretty. There's there's some photos in the book of this Sora being lit up, and I think you can even see a mosquito in one of the photos. <laughs> Mosquitoes are always involved in field like, research, like, I think. Gently harnessed a little radio, trans radio transmitter backpack onto this rail. <laughs> That's awesome. And so what does she, I can't remember from I, when I was flipping through, what is yeah. she, um, what information is she working to acquire from the transmitters? Uh, she wants to better understand rail migration, which we don't know a whole lot about because they're really kind of secretive and hard to yeah. study. And if I recall correctly, one of the things that makes rail migration sort of unique is they do these really long stopovers. Like songbirds, when they're migrating, they might stop somewhere along the way for like a day to so kind of rest and refuel before they go on. But but I guess the rails, the Sora and other rails she studies, will kind of hang around in that area for like a couple of weeks during migration and move on. And so she wants to know what habitats they're using while they're there so that they know better how to manage them because they, they manage wetlands for ducks a lot yeah yeah but she wants to know like how are the rails using the habitat while they're there and where are they hanging out so they can know how to manage for rails also oh, interesting yeah, yeah. so the nearest 
wildlife refuge to us is the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. And um, yes, the rails, they're wonderful. They make these all these beautiful noises and you never see them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think. Um, um, one thing that fascinated me when I was flipping through the book is the Terra Project devices. Uh, yeah. Are they any closer? And for those of you um, who haven't had a chance to read the book, I believe you said it was a Kickstarter for a recording device or a listening device yeah it was these folks that were i think it, i think it was one of the companies that sells tracking devices to researchers that was working on this but it was a it was a kickstarter and i believe the kickstarter was successful for a gadget that you were going to be able to put out in your backyard that would both like automatically record and recognize the calls of different birds that were around, but also pick up like any of these modus transmitters. Like if a bird flew by wearing one of these radio transmitters, it could pick it up and tell you about it. And I have to admit, since I turned in the book, I have not looked for an update on whether they made, whether they've made any progress with actually sending them out. I should check on that. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, and that's okay. I can look it up too, but I was like, Oh, I want one of those. <laughs> I need to know what they are. You've got um, Google it other tab you can, <laughs> can pre-order them okay i don't know that it says what it looks like it looks like they're not available yet there's no date on the website okay okay well i'll have to come back and look again money, i'm curious like um were there any project or you know studies that you read projects that you were aware of you know that you were just really fascinated by that you couldn't include in the book for whatever reason Oh, that's a really good question. So while I was working on this book, at one point, um, a fellow who I knew a little bit via Twitter by the name of Joe Segrist, who studies purple martins, I believe he's the, the head of the Purple Martin Conservation Association or something like that, sent me a DM on Twitter asking if I knew about this person in South America who had captured a bunch of purple martins and like painted their feathers with like UV fluorescent paint so that when they then flew back to North America and like molted their feathers. You could collect the feathers and figure out if they had come from this area, if they, their feathers. Yeah. Oh, and interesting. Wild story, but as far as I can figure out, no one has like no results from it were ever published, at least not in English, not anywhere where you can act, where you can access them. And it was one of those things where like this, it was really cool that like the, the chapters of the book are sort of organized by technique that people use to study birds and I'm like that does not fit into any of these chapters yeah not really <laughs> done anything like this so I don't think I can yeah. write a whole chapter about painting bird feathers with UV fluorescent paint so that did not make it into yeah. the book like that is a really weird unique story yeah. well it's interesting because it's another thing like Ariel's um you know you know line and and nets yeah. is that <laughs> and sometimes you know, the, the, the technology is amazing and it's allowed us to do so many things, but yeah. sometimes you can, you know, people come up with these really brilliant ideas that are just really low tech. So, oh, that's, that's kind of a bummer. That would have been really cool. I know. Um, the, another one that I was really fascinated by because it sort of, um, it uh, crosses over some research that I've had to do for work stuff that I've worked on. And that's the Argos satellites. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've researched them in context of ocean science and the, uh, particularly the, the, uh, the uh, little autonomous devices that go mm -hmm. down and take measurements and then pop up and hook into that system. And then they go yeah. back down again and they're, they're all over the world in the, in the world's oceans, but it sounds like they're also using that system. And maybe then now they've graduated to something more specific. I thought you had said to the birds, but that how they're using satellite technology to help them track. Yeah, no, that, so that you're absolutely right. The Argo system is a system of satellites that was first deployed for oceanographic research for like tracking automated buoys and stuff. I know it is the same Argo satellite system that's still used quite a bit for wildlife tracking. Like wildlife researchers very quickly figured out that they could sort of hook into this same satellite tracking system yeah. by putting the same transmitters on animals. And I think the first animal that they tracked using the Argos system was a polar bear. But it is so Argos transmitters are actually still used on on birds a fair amount. They also now of course you know, there are other types of trackers that use GPS satellites also. And but, I think I thought you said that you were talking about one that like the satellite system was a little bit lower than the Argos satellites. Is that a different system or are those GPS satellites? 
Ooh, I don't hmm, I don't remember the GPS satellites without looking it up. So there's the Argus yeah. satellites, which are kind of this this older system that, that yeah. is yeah. still going, but they I think they were working on upgrading it, but it's been around for quite a while. And then there's GPS technology, which was developed by the military and then eventually yeah. released for public use. And those are the same ones that we use for G like yeah. navigating our cars and stuff, but they also there are transmitters for birds that track locations with GPS. Okay. And then but while there was this guy in Germany trying to get a new space based tracking system going called Icarus that had a receiver that was on the International Space oh, Station. Okay. But that is now kaput because of the war in Ukraine because it relied yeah. on, relied yeah. on some partnership. Oh, department. that's a good one. That's it, good. Icarus has been killed by that, unfortunately. Yeah, let's see. Where did I? That was that was interesting because it was after I initially turned in the the manuscript of my book that just broke that Icarus had gone offline because of the war in Ukraine. And so I had to be oh. like, wait, wait, I have to write another paragraph. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Well, and I think, I mean, I'm laughing as I, you know, I ask questions and, and, you know, I know that the, the lay person does always have insight into this. So for those of you who aren't aware, like you write a book and it goes to the editor and then there's a very long process in between of, you know, publishing, yeah. you know, printing and everything. And so mm -hmm. I'm I'm hitting Rebecca up with these questions that you know she might not have looked at for a very long time. So I know I've had people do that to me. You know, the my book will come out and they'll be like, "Well, what about this and such and so?" And I'm like, "That was like two years ago. I don't remember." You would think I would have it all memorized, but some of the stuff about no. like satellite system was higher up. I'm like, "Oh, I'd have to look yeah. it up." Yeah, it's like, "Oh, I look that up again." <laughs> So I'm going to switch up to be just uh, move away from the book a little bit and just be a little bit more, um, you know, sort of universal um, and bird loving and all of that. And just ask if you have any, um, you know, like things that you do in your own yard or in your own community um, that benefit birds specifically and then additionally, if you, you know, if somebody watches the in interview and says, oh, hey, I want to, you know, know more about birds or whatever, any tips for getting started if it's, if you're like a brand new bird watcher and you haven't really awesome. ever done it before and maybe you feel very. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so two separate questions there. Yes. You said, you said it's the <laughs> in my yard. Oh, yes. Because starting. Yeah. Starting as a pandemic project in spring 2020, we have gradually been ripping up more and more of the grass in our yard and replacing it with native plants. I think we have 50% as much turf as we have turf now as we did before. Yeah, good. So yeah, it start, started, started with DIY in our front yard and then this past fall had a local like native plant landscaping professional come and help us do part of the backyard. But yes, oh, about, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah so about, about half of what was lawn has now been replaced with, with native plants that are you know, directly support birds that eat, you know, seeds and stuff, and then also support insects that birds eat. So we're working on, you know, we have a little normal sized suburban yard and gradually working on improving our little patch of habitat to make it more bird friendly as best we can. And so that's, that's something that I would encourage anyone to do. It's pretty, pretty yeah. easy to get started. Googling like Yeah, this. yeah. And stuff. So you asked, so for like, for someone who is interested in birds, but doesn't really know where to start, one of the first things I would suggest doing if you just haven't like don't know where to start at all is to download an app called Merlin, which is put up by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and it's free and it will help you identify the birds in your area based on your location and your date. It will tell you kind of what birds are most likely for where you are and you can scroll through a whole list of them with photos or, or it'll guide you through some questions where it's like, okay, you saw a bird like was it the size of a sparrow or the size of a crow? And what colors did you see and what was it doing? And then it'll give you based on that kind of the most likely candidates for your date and location. And it can also identify birds by song. So you can use, oh, the, microphone. Wow. You can use the microphone on your smartphone and just, just like in real time, it will listen to birds singing around you and like pop oh, up. I, I know what I'm downloading after I get off. I didn't, I, I wasn't, I kind I'm of seen it, 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 but I've never tried it. What was that? I said, I use it all the time when I'm birding, so I'm not very good at birding by ear. It's great. So I'll just pull out my smartphone and be like, okay, what bird is that thing? And yeah. Oh, sounds well, that's horrible. amazing. Yeah, I haven't tried that at all. I've seen, like I said, I've seen like ads for it and stuff, but I had never gotten around to downloading. 
recommend. So I think for anyone who wants to just start learning some of the birds in their neighborhood but doesn't know where to start, I would recommend them like the Merlin app is a very easy way to get into get into it a little bit. That's very cool. Yeah. So um circling back to the native plants, because that's something that I know we've tried to do in our yard some somewhat <laughs> as well. Um ha, do you can you have you noticed a like a noticeable difference in species um, that have that hang around as you've worked to, on this project and as you've as you've um, brought more native plants in. Um, that's a really good question. It's it's still relatively new. Like like the the plants in the backyard we just planted last fall, so it's not a whole yeah. lot there yet, except mulch. And I expect as more that grows in, we'll get more birds coming in there. Definitely, we we get a lot of insects, and we have fun looking at all the yeah. bugs. And I. I don't know that I've had that many different types of birds, but we definitely just get a, a like good numbers of yeah, yeah. birds and all sorts of stuff in our yard. Um, we have, I think this is not necessarily a function specifically of having native plants so much as just leaving a lot of dead leaves on the ground, but we have had yeah. toes stopping by our yard occasionally. Yes, in the I love them. As a forest. And so, you know, you know, toey's foraging habitat is very specific, yeah. like leaves on the ground. So by yeah. let the dead leaves just pile up against our back edge, sometimes the toey will come and spend a week or so hanging around back there. Yeah. yeah, we're actually lucky enough to have, I don't think they're nesting on our, in our um, yard, but I pretty nearby because every cool. year the, oh, the fledglings will come and hang out in the backyard and they're pretty silly but i it's i wish i was just really curious because i know that you've been working on that project for a little bit and i know that what i've noticed is i did project feeder watch for, for mm -hmm. cornell for quite a few years and then kind of fell off doing that and then you know for a series of years there's been the problems with the feeders you know problems yeah. with disease outbreaks at feeders and stuff and so I've pretty much stopped feeding unless we have a big snowstorm or something then I'll put some seed out but I've noticed that you know we maybe don't have quite the volume of birds that we would if we had a feeder because of course yeah. they all flock to it but we definitely just you know year round have birds that are utilizing the habitat because I leave the seed heads out and all kinds of stuff and so they're coming yeah. for the buffet it's just not the feeders it's other plants and stuff so that's been really fun to see yeah yeah we don't do but, a feeder other than a hummingbird feeder but we just tried to like improve the, the more natural habitat that's there and we do yeah. have a little bath with a bubbler in it so the water doesn't get stuck. yeah that's fun I have water too and then, I've yeah. got like a brush pile and stuff so just doing things to yeah give the yeah. birds more naturally hang out we get a lot of song sparrows and white crown sparrows and both kinds of goldfinches and juncos in the winter yeah that's yeah. fun I enjoy it because I just enjoy having them hang around and all yeah. the songs right now because yeah. you know spring and all they're all out singing <laughs> so um I had asked you this at the beginning before we started recording but do you have um not just necessarily just um, book projects, but other uh, topics that you're working on that you're really excited about, or um, you know, or possibly a book project in the future that you're probably not, you know, there to talk about it quite yet. But just stuff that's still really interesting you and that you'd like to write more about in the future, maybe. Yeah, I do have aspirations to start working on a proposal for a second book later this year. But yeah, I don't know that I really want to. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> talk to my agent and be like is it okay to talk publicly about the idea that we yeah. yeah so that, that might happen that would be exciting and then yeah I do a lot of other bird related writing so I've pretty much always got some assignment or another going for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology magazine I just turned in a piece for them about a study of warblers gut microbiomes oh interesting yeah, and then I had a piece in their winter issue, a feature on research on the cognition of mountain chickadees, like their spatial memory, which was really cool. Yeah. Is that yeah. because they like store food? Yeah. And the higher up the mountain they live, the smarter they get, the smarter they are. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, living too low, apparently. <laughs> yeah, so they're like comparing the spatial reasoning abilities of mountain chickadees living at different elevations on the same mountain and finding oh, interesting. About the difference there's like natural selection going on differentiating the chick of the mountain chick yeah. higher up which is really cool there's a good guy in 
Nevada named Vladimir Provisudo, who's working on this. And yeah, I write for like the author. I write news stories about ornithology stuff for the Audubon website sometimes. I write occasionally for Birds Out Radio, which is like a syndicated, very short, it's like a it's both a podcast and like syndicated radio show that's just like two minutes a day or something like that. Oh, show. cool. Is and you said that was Bird Note Radio? No, it's yeah, it's the name of okay. it for them sometimes. Um yeah, I'm just a, I'm a yeah. freelance bird writer, which is a fun niche to be in. Yeah, it's it's not, I, I would imagine there's not that many of you out there. <laughs> um, is there a particular, because you mentioned a podcast, but are there um, magazines, um, you know, blogs, online resources? Um, you mentioned Merlin ID, which is fantastic. Um, again, for, for people who are like maybe they've been watching birds for a while, but they haven't really looked into resources or again, somebody who's fairly new to the whole idea and and maybe wants to subscribe to a magazine or a, or a newsletter or something along those lines. I really think that everything that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology does is great. Their website is allaboutbirds.org where they have all the articles from their magazine, but lots of other, this is the same group that puts out that Merlin app, but there's lots of like bird ID resources and little free online classes you can take about bird watching okay. and, then, and then other ones that you pay for. But I think this, so they have a whole bunch of just like bird uh, bird watching and ornithology related class, like self-paced classes just aimed at the aimed at members of the public who are interested in that sort of thing. There are also the folks who do eBird, which is an app where you can like track and log, track and submit your bird sightings and they have live webcams of you know bird feeders from different locations in the world and so and then they and then they put out if you want to you know donate and become a member or whatever you can also get yeah them. yeah so yeah all about birds.org is, is a really cool website to check out all right well thank you so so much for for uh joining us tonight and i'm super excited about your book and i'm glad you're getting to do all kinds of interesting things to introduce it to the world um so we'll keep tabs on you so that we can find out what you're working on next <laughs> okay thank you for having me have a good night you too bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.